So I'm going quickly here. Uh, buckle your seatbelts and let's have at it. So I'm going to talk about diversity, how diversity drives innovation and connecting it with the business. First of all, uh, starting with strategy, diversity, equity, inclusion strategy. The strategy is to engage our people as business owners, diverse leaders inspired by inclusion, innovation, and growth. So on the bottom left here is my uh, diversity logo. Uh, don't try to use this. Uh, if you do, you have to pay me a royalty, but it's really these three things. It's a wheel, have the right mix, make the mix work, integrate with the business. And the center is creating a culture of inclusion. So as you look at this, most folks that have done this type of work start over on the top left, having the right mix. And they try to push everyone to do this work. If I sell Clorox bleach at an army base, that makes me a government contractor. Therefore, now I have to submit an affirmative action plan to the government that talks about my hiring, promotion, good faith efforts, what conferences I'm going to, et cetera. And so you push, push, push. And at some point, the business leaders like Charlene will say, okay, I'm going to do that to a point, but I'm too busy running the business. So they start pushing back. What I did is actually I started with integrating with the business to create pull from the CEO and all the C-suite executives into this work because it's connected to the business. It's not a side gig that only I'm doing. So having the right mix, right, is making sure we have the right type of talent that can drive our global growth and innovation, making this mix work, you know, employees that are in an inclusive environment are engaged, more engaged, they give discretionary effort. You know, they really are connected to the business. And ultimately our diversity, equity, inclusion work has to be tightly integrated with our business activities to drive uh, global growth and innovation. So some data, it's always good to have a little bit of data. Uh, a quote that I love about data, uh, you can look up the quote, uh, it's really a bit unknown who came up with it. It's probably attributed to Mark Twain because he said it the most, but he didn't invent it. So when you think about data, uh, it's really the definition of lies. There are three types of lies lies, damn lies, and statistics. So I'm gonna give you some statistics. As we look at the changing demographics in the US from 1940 to 2040, we look at 1980, the country was 80-20, 80% 80 white, 20% minority, black, Latino, and a smaller proportion for uh, Asian. Today, we're about 60-40. And, and, and you see that the largest group is really Latinos now, they've outsurpassed black. So as you look at this data, you think about it is, uh, what's happened here? Particularly what has not changed. So if you look at what hasn't changed, and you could probably see it yourself, is the proportion of blacks to the total population has remained flat about 12%. And I'm responsible. And here's why. To sustain a race, you need two and a half people per family, two and a half kids per family to sustain a race. Because if the parents pass away and there's no kids, then the race gets smaller statistically, right? So I have one son, Irby the third. My dad's Irby Sr., I'm Irby Jr., my son's Irby the third. My sister has one daughter. So we're not doing very good. But what saved us is my cousin John has seven kids and my cousin Howard has three. So between the four fosters, we've got 12 kids divided by four, three kids per family. So the fosters are gonna do okay in the future. But really what's happened here statistically is that white plus any other race is a minority. So if you go back to 50s, 60s, 70s, why uh, we didn't have much interracial marriage because it was illegal in a number of states, particularly in the South. So you had to come out here west to California where I'm at, or maybe north to Canada to have interracial marriage, right? Because it was illegal. Uh, and the other reason is for Blacks, that's one reason, and the other is not having enough kids. So the solution would be have more kids. Now, why is this important? It's interesting that you can talk about data and statistics, but here's why. If you're talking about consumers and consumer data, it's, it's nice that Latinos are 16, 7% of the population, and they've more than doubled from 1990 they were about 9% of the population 2020. They're now you know, 16, 17%. Um, and the population's gone up, but really the spending power has gone up 10X. So you go from 200 billion, you see there in this table on the left to 2 trillion. Is this a consumer group that you can afford to ignore? 
right? Because I think the business will help you drive the innovation. And if you look at this table that I inserted here on buying power. So census data is what almost everybody uses. But if you want to try to get the executive's attention that's running the business, you need something that's connected to the business, right? Um, so if I look at the buying power, right? Latinos are 16%, but they are $1.5 trillion on the way to $2 trillion spend. So that's going to get the business leader's attention because most of us are in business to make money, right? If we're not, then it's a hobby. The IRS rule is to be considered a business, you have to make money three out of five years. If you don't do that, that's a hobby. So all of us are in business. We're not working for free, I don't think. Maybe some of you are. But we want to make sure that all this work that we're doing is business connected. So who are the millennials? Right? If you look at the workforce trends below, baby boomers born post-World War II, 1945 to 65, 70, 76 trillion people, a million. Gen Xers got gypped because their generation is only for 15 years, 65 to 80. So the, most generations are about 20 years. Millennials, 1980 to 2000. Now, a lot of confusion and misinformation about who a millennial is. A person born in 1980 became an adult in 2000, a new millennium, and that's how the term millennial came about. So I know some of you are probably born in the late 70s, 78, 79, 77, and trying to call yourself millennial. Uh, that's a hard no. You're not a millennial, right? Unless you were born in 1980. I'm a dad of millennials, so I know. My son's born in 1991. So they look at diversity, equity, and inclusion in an employer. So it's important that you know this. The buying power is $250 billion, but the influence is $500 billion. How can that happen? My son, Irby III, he's not only spending his money, he's spending my money. So that's where the influence comes from. He's trying to pick a sports car that he thinks I like so I could buy it and pass it on to him. That's how he influences me. Hey, dad, you look really good in that Corvette. Why don't you buy it? Because I know after about five years, you're going to be tired of it. Then you can pass it on to me. So that's kind of how he influences me. But if we do nothing, millennials are 44% minority compared to boomers who are only 28%. So if you look at the data, as boomers retire, the workforce is going to get more diverse just with the passage of time. But you want to be in front of that as a business leader, because by in five years from now, millennials are going to make up 75 percent of the workforce as more boomers retire and more immigrant millennials from other countries come here to the U.S. to start businesses. So the good news for millennials is there's not enough Gen Xers to replace the boomers. So we need to dip into the millennial talent pool now to get them ready for leadership earlier than past generations. So that's my advice on that topic. Now, women, multicultural, and millennials. So women and multicultural consumers account for 80% of all shoppers. Women's the largest group, millennials is the fastest growing, and multicultural, and millennials represent our future. But when we hear the term inclusion, it's really about building a team with thoughts and beliefs when combined, create a more comprehensive solution to business issues. Even though this seems like an obvious truth, it's remarkable how seldom we actually apply it. So we've got diversity, everyone's an individual, equality, equal access to opportunities and inclusion, this sense of belonging. Now, I love puzzle pieces. It's nice, I like to play chess, but it's also in this diversity, equity, inclusion work to play a little puzzles. So in the center of this puzzle is the core areas, race, gender, sexual orientation. And that's been true for 50 years. But as we're looking at what's happening now in 2010, 2020, is that there's more things that we need to come into play. Thinking styles, age, job levels, skills, nationality, religion, it's really quite extensive. But what I love about the puzzle pieces is that in a puzzle, each piece is a different shape, size, and color but they all fit together quite nicely to create this wonderful mosaic. So let's play a little bit puzzle and I'm gonna take you on this journey to a culture of inclusion. So past, present, future. In the past, we were focused on recruiting more women and minorities, 
as a person of color, I'm a beneficiary of that strategy, right? Employee resource groups, ERGs, they help build networks, give you a sense of belonging. There's more people that look like me that have similar experience. And then the multicultural marketing insights really help us with career advancement programs that we're creating this pull, as I said in the very beginning. But the past, and here's a quote, and I'll give quotes along the way. I didn't come up with them, but actually I think they're pretty good, so I'm gonna share them with you. The past is a place of reference, not a place of residence. So it's okay to understand history in the past, but don't stop there. In the present, we're looking at employee resource groups to help us reach diverse consumers, cultural insights, not just language, but culture, right? Because if, if Spanish is the language, we can all take a class on how to speak Spanish, but if we haven't grown up in that culture, then that's something that's missing that the employees can help us put together. The present. Getting recognized as a leading company in the diversity arena, fantastic, but the competition. So here in the Bay Area, right, I'm in San Francisco, the competition is not other consumer packaged goods companies. You know, Procter & Gamble's in Cincinnati, right? Uh, General Mills uh, in Minneapolis. In the Bay Area, the competition is tech companies, right? Tesla, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn. So in a sense, we have to be a tech blocker. If we find great talent, we don't wanna train them up and let other companies hire them away, right? And then we get in this constant trying to hire talent. So we wanna make sure that we understand what's happening around us so that we can connect better. So the way we did that was connecting the employees to the business. Uh, here's seven examples below in the center, you know, Glad Matchwear, Kingsford, Clorox Forganzia, Soyve, Burt's Bees, Nueva Casina, Brita up in Canada, right? A, a Canadian strategy. These are all Clorox brands that you may or may not be aware of, but we look to the employees to help us connect to those brands and drive growth and innovation. And then in the future, going back to my puzzle piece here on the right, is making sure that we're building teams with thoughts, beliefs, and more comprehensive solutions. Because essentially, that's kind of the key with this whole diversity puzzle piece is making sure that we have those kinds of things. So let's go quickly through the diversity phases. Some of you are aware of the first couple of phases. Uh, you're probably deep in them. You may not be as involved with the later phases. So let me take you through them. And these are like the 10 uh, employee groups down below that, we, that uh, we launched from scratch. Because at Clorox, it's a company that started in 1913 in Oakland, California. And when I joined in 2006, uh, there was no diversity, anything, no ERGs, no recruiting, nothing. Um, so essentially, it was a diversity startup inside a 100-year-old company. So there was a lot to learn, but there was a lot to innovate as well. So phase one, cultural awareness, social gathering, celebrating heritage, February, Black History Month, March, you know, Women History, May, Asian Heritage, June, Pride, uh, September, October, Hispanic Heritage, right? So we wanted to make sure we've got the belonging people can bring their whole selves to work and they can network with other folks. Then we get to this talent development, you know, mentoring and coaching, making sure we're giving kind of skills where they're needed, we're sharing with one another, and then we're enhancing our professional development. But where you want to move to next is not get stuck with just these annual celebration events, but we want to become advisors to the company, how to benchmark outside the organization, how to get some alliances that help the business, how to create this talent pipeline. Where should we be recruiting at that we get access to the talent, right? Uh, how do we collaborate with other groups and then more multicultural? But ultimately where you want to land on is business advocates, enhancing our capabilities so we can be competitive. We want to drive new products and services. We want to enhance the brand image of the company you know, more community outreach programs, multicultural marketing, and then ultimately having a positive impact on the bottom line. So here's one example of taking all that strategy and applying it to one of the employee resource groups, the pride group. So taking through this timeline, and the key question you should be asking yourself is, what is our aspiration? And what's the pace of change the organization can absorb to get there? 
Is this something we're trying to do in six months, 12, 18 months? Is it two to three years? Is it five to seven years? So remember, we're in this diversity startup inside a 100 year old company, right? So we began with hiring the first diversity executive. That's me, right? Doing some recruiting, getting a perfect 100 on the cap, uh, corporate equality index, right? These were some aspirations. And in the first year, we got all those kinds of things done and attending the Out and Equal Conference, which is the largest you know, workplace equality conference in the country, about 3,000 participants a year. Then we bring our CEO to be the keynote speaker in 2008. The conference was in Austin, Texas. First ever Fortune 500 CEO, straight white man, to give a keynote at the Out and Equal Conference. Then we get recognized by our customers you know, uh, Walmart, if you didn't know, is fortune number one. A lot of people think it's ExxonMobil. If oil prices go up, it might be. But Walmart at 500 billion is the largest company in the Fortune 500 with 2.3 million employees. And Clorox was recognized only one company a year. We were recognized in 2010 by, out in, uh, by Walmart with the Martin Luther King Visionary Award for our, what we were driving with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then some other things along the way. So we take this back to those phases that I gave you a couple of slides ago, cultural awareness, talent development, trusted advisors, and ultimately you wanna move that to business advocates. So you see, we went from being unknown in this space to being recognized as a leader uh, and then taking this work international. Now that we've done the company, let's look a bit about talent. So cultivating diverse talent. Hopefully uh, most of you can see someone that looks like you in these images that I put on the right there to try to be inclusive. So I love these. These are all great looking families and individuals. Uh, that's fantastic. But when we think about talent, I call it the ABCs of developing talent because uh, Clark has a June 30 year end. So most of you have, if you think back to your childhood, you have these uh, school pictures. So imagine this, on June 30, okay, everybody leave the building and stand outside. Okay, Irby, we'd like you to take a photo. Now count up all the women and minorities, and that's our diversity score. And that looked good. And we did that every year, right? Counting up the people. But what I noticed with turnover was there were different people in the photo. And that's what makes it hard to move the needle on this if you have a high turnover issue. So you need to understand it's not just window dressing and bringing in more people or bottom loading and adding a lot of entry level folks. You need folks at the leadership level. So if we think about this, right, the ABCs, advancement. How do you help people in the company advance? You know, that's giving them access to influential mentors and sponsors and the relationship with their managers and colleagues. Because someone say, well, Irby, you can go to that meeting. That's great. Uh, you don't get any credit for that because when you come back here, you still have to do your work and you have to stay light, late tonight. So if my manager's not embracing what I'm doing, it doesn't help me to advance. The business connection is critical, right? Diversity drives business growth and innovation. And we want more market share with more multicultural consumers. So if I wanted diversity, right, and I look at where we recruit and creating this culture of inclusion, right? Not only getting more flow into the company of talent, but the advancement and retention of that talent to drive top line growth. So I went to uh, University of Southern California, USC, probably most known for sports. You know, they are in the final four for basketball. They've been to Rose Bowls and uh, national championships, a lot of athletes out of USC, but it also has a great business school and a great school of accounting. And, and that's where I got my degrees from. So if the executive, the chief people officer said, I want more diverse talent. I can go to one school, USC, and get all the diverse talent I want. Asian, Black, Latino, LGBT, women, people with disabilities, veterans, immigrants, right? They, are, they all attend that school, as most universities. But the challenge is going to be that universities take a lot of pride training up people a certain way. Harvard's famous for the case studies, case competition. So what we'll, I'll give is consensus, but I won't get different points of view. I'll get people thinking the same way. So how I had to help the company understand this is there's smart people everywhere, uh, but they all don't work at this company. So if I take Clark's as an example, you know, $6 billion company, 8,000 employees, all 8,000 employees at Clark's are very smart. 
So anytime I say Clorox or any company, you can insert your own company. If your company has 100,000 employees or Walmart with 2 million employees, all 2 million employees at Walmart are very smart. But all the smart people in the world don't work at Walmart because there's 7.9 billion people in the world. So it would either be arrogant or naive to believe that only the people that work at your company are smart. So how do we tap into that talent and keep the great talent that we have? So here's one example. If you have a company that has low turnover and it's a promote from within culture, there's very few spots at the top where people could advance to. So we need to make sure that you know, there's a place for them to go. So the challenge would be is that in uh, making sure that our legacy practices aren't dominating everything that we do. So with the product supply organization, we implemented this plus one approach. If you have a team with 10 people, then add one more that's different, they get equal rights of, you know, uh, except for HR type things and salaries and promotions, but they're an equal voice. So that's a way that you can bring different knowledge to a group that you would otherwise miss based on hierarchy. And the results were is that all throughout the, or, the product supply organization, we looked at 30 different teams and each of those teams added one person that was different. Uh, could be a millennial, could be a person of color, could be someone younger, could be someone from a different part of the organization. And that's a way that we created this innovation. So just kind of wrapping up so we get to a couple of questions. So Uber yourself before you get Kodak. If you look at Kodak, in 1888, George Eastman and Henry Strong started the Kodak company. Fast forward nine years. In 1976, Kodak had 85% of the camera business and 90% of the film business. They were a monopoly. In 1975, one of the engineers, and this, this is a little known fact, actually invented the digital camera. But the board and executives were making so much money off the cameras and the film that they ignored the digital camera and they ended up going bankrupt in 2005. So here's a company that had a century of success, a decade of decline, and then they went bankrupt. So we wanna make sure that we're being innovative. At the same time out here on the West Coast, there was a small company called PayPal. And in 2002, these nine individuals, the founders of PayPal, eight white guys, one Asian, sold to eBay for $1.5 billion. Now you look at the faces, you may not know, they're not household names, most of them. You probably recognize the person at the top right, Elon Musk, he was one of them. And you look at all of these logos that surround them, SpaceX, Tesla, LinkedIn, all of us I think are on LinkedIn. Reed Hoffman actually was the founder of LinkedIn and three years ago he sold that to Microsoft for 26 billion. These three engineers and designers at the bottom left, Steve Chan, Chad Hurley, Jared Karim, they, in 2006, they sold YouTube to Google for $1.5 billion. That's all great, well and good, but I want you to imagine the world for a minute. If just one of these individuals was black, Latino, or a woman in terms of growth and wealth. So finally, the measure of a success is not whether you have a difficult problem to deal with, but whether it's the same problem you had last year. The core of this work today, leverage DI to increase the hiring, speak at conferences like this one today, Opal Group, bring your leadership team. Don't just send the Asians to the Asian conference or the Blacks to the Black conference or Latinos to this conference or Pride to this conference or women to this one. Actually bring people with you that don't, reckon, don't identify with those groups so they can learn what it is to be a minority making sure that you're providing actionable steps to people and that you have the diverse talent assigning them to stretch roles and projects. And then ultimately having a small inclusive group where everyone can be, uh, have opportunities to grow in advance. So that's concludes kind of my slides. We'll try to grab a couple of questions if we can. Yes, here I am. <laughs> Sorry, trying to unmute. Okay. But yes, I, I do. Thank you so much, Irby. Um, I do love that slide um, in terms of reference of the founders and what uh, a difference it could have, should have, would have made with that very important note about 
having an inclusive um, and a culturally inclusive team. So I think that that's definitely food for thought. And I actually had no idea until you gave me the preview of the slide before today. Um, but I digress. Let me just um, jump into the question here. Um, how This is from uh, Cor Cordelia. How do you measure the success and contribution of ERGs? I've heard mixed feedback as to the effectiveness regarding driving DE&I. Yeah, I think it's you have. I, I think it's starting with the business. So we've had brands acquisitions. We've had market share increases. We look at uh, how to drive the business, and I think those. What are the executives measuring? So I don't consider diversity as like some kind of bolt on site. I always view myself as the general manager of diversity, just like there's a general manager of the different businesses, and it's really a way to track how is the business better uh, than it was before and also people advancing. So one lasting thing, right, to say that is, if I look at the leadership of, of the company, right, and we did all this work and that's nice and the board was, you know, not very diverse, but now it did get to be diverse. Uh, Linda Rendell is the CEO of Clorox. Uh, 20 years ago, she graduated from Harvard, undergrad. Worked for three years at Procter & Gamble because her dad worked there, I think it was pressure for her to work at P&G. 17 years at, at 25 years old, 17 years ago, she came to Clorox as a business analyst. And in 2020, she became the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. That's not window dressing. That's, so it's having the company think that there's different people that can be leaders. Troy Datcher, who's from Alabama, went to Gettysburg College. He's now the chief customer officer leading global sales for a Fortune 500 company. Diego Barral from Argentina is leading the international business. So I think it's how I measure it is that the makeup of the company is different in terms of leadership. And that's because now we can see folks that, as different kinds of leaders from a variety of backgrounds. Perfect, I was taking a few notes here and I think that's really important. I mean, the idea of making sure that we have inclusive teams is really at the forefront. I mean, at your organization, the Clorox company, it was obviously, I think, ahead of the curve, but now it's very important for everyone to not, not miss that at all. It's really becoming a priority, even for those organizations that are still hiring a chief diversity and inclusion officer right now. So um, I love that you at Clorox Company have years of experience. I love the timeline that you showed. Um, I wanna jump in and ask a little bit about, because you have had several roles with global companies, Clorox, uh, McDonald's, PepsiCo, uh, could you tell us about a time that you encountered unconscious bias in the workplace or felt that you had to break through a glass ceiling and what was it like for you? And this is probably your last question, but it's a good one. Oh, it's a good one, it's a great one. So I'll, I'll start early in my career. Actually, so I'm a CPA, so I might, actually out of college, I was at Arthur Anderson and Company, right? Uh, and I was in the Los Angeles office with a thousand professionals, 10 of which were black, right? When I became manager, I was the first manager, uh, black audit manager in the Western United States, right? So when it came time to be considered for partner, the partners asked me what would be my book of business. And they assumed it was gonna be black owned businesses. Okay, so I read Fortune and Forbes and you know Wall Street Journal and also Black Enterprise Magazine. And I said, that's unrealistic because here in Southern California, where I was at the time, the largest black owned business was a former NFL player who had a couple of auto dealerships. There was no big gigantic you know, tech company or something. So if, if, if that's what it takes me to be a partner, then it's unrealistic. And you know, I didn't, I didn't become a partner, I ended up leaving that. That's, it's different now than then, but it was the way that when people look at me, they see, well, I'm black. Well, actually I'm a CPA that happens to be black. I'm not a black CPA because there's no such thing. So it's how people view you and they, they kind of put uh, limitation on what your capabilities are. Yeah, no, I think, well said, Irby, and, and we are at time, but I think that was a great point to end on. Um, one of many bullet points that I hope everyone at home is jotting down and, and taking away from today. So Irby, thank you for taking the time and for sharing all of that as well. And um, I'll have to say goodbye at this point and get ready for our next session. Thank you so much, Irby. Have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.